Well, it's a joy to welcome you to Kasalem this evening. And tonight we're going to be looking at the mouth that brings peace. We're going to look at the tongue tonight. And uh, we'll look at a number of Proverbs, but mainly from Ch Proverbs chapter 15. James says this about the tongue. It says that the tongue is a fire. It says it's a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father. And with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. For the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine produces figs? Neither can salt pond yield fresh water. Well, let's pray together to start. Father, thank you so much for the clarity of your words. Lord, it shows us the different attitudes and uh, the feelings from our hearts, but Lord, help us to understand more and more how to live this life to give you glory. We pray this for your lovely name's sake. Amen. Well, let's sing together.
Well, let's read uh, Proverbs chapter 15 together as we look at the tongue. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, for he loves him who pursues righteousness. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. Shale and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of man. A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is crushed. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart are continually feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. The way of the sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. A wise son makes glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisers they succeed. To make an apt answer is a joy to man, and a word in season how good it is. The path of life leads upward for the prudent, that he may turn away from shale beneath. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, uh, but gracious words are pure. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponder how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoice with the Lord, and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to living, giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom and humility comes before honour. Well, lots to dwell upon as we think about the tongue and the wise life. We're going to have a look at a, a clip now by Sinclair Ferguson on the tongue, and then we will sing together before the sermon. Tongues that were given him to pray, given us to praise him, that express far more excitement in idolatry than in doxology. Tongues that were given to praise him, that remain silent in worship or are deadened in praise. On the Lord's day, tongues that were given to speak words of love that then speak words of flattery and lust and adultery, tongues given to speak the truth that tell fabrications, just a little less than the truth, tongues that were meant to give, 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 that take, 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 take. You know, sometimes I wonder if the misuse of the tongue is actually a peculiarly evangelical sin. How many occasions I've been with brothers, and as somebody's name has been mentioned, the first lash of the tongue is to destroy that brother. Yes, he may not be perfect. Yes, he may have many peculiarities, foibles, not yet fully formed, 
But how dare I destroy with a word a brother for whom Christ has died within the context of the fellowship of God's people? You see, careless with fire. Let's open up our Bibles again to Proverbs 15, verse 1. It says this, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, we've all had to deal with our own tongues, and we've had to deal with other people's tongues. And there's that phrase, isn't there? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, never has an more untrue phrase been spouted by parents to their kids after they've been hurt in the playground. No, words do hurt us and they show us really the heart of a person when they say it, but also they leave lasting damage. We all know of moments where we've been hurt and we know of uh, scars that have been given by people and we can maybe even know the feeling, the time, the, the event that it happened because of harsh words that have been said. There was a man called Billy Bray, he was a preacher in Cornwall and he was a brash man, he was a drinker, he was a man who would get into fights and when he became a Christian the biggest thing that his family and friends and the surrounding area said was that his tongue changed. He would use his tongue to glorify God and not to build up himself, not to boast, not to tear down, not to gossip or fault find, but to give glory to God. And James, as we read at the beginning, it's amazing that salt water can come out of uh, a place where fresh water cut should come. S people who should praise can so often destroy and tear down. And it's interesting how our tongues can be used for good and for bad. We know that wars have started because of a person's tongue. Community, communities have been ripped apart by stupid or angry words. Marriages have been broken. Families have been destroyed. But also, on the opposing side, a word in season gives glory to God, draws people close to the King. We can use our tongue as a method to share the good news of Christ so that people can understand 
the gospel. And there's no mistake in Proverbs 15.3, in the middle of speaking about the tongue, it says, 15 verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. The Lord is saying that he's interested the way we use our tongues, the way we speak about people in front of them and behind them, the way we speak about him, the way we use our words. You see, the Lord understands what's within us, but he wants us to be different to this world. He wants us as Christians to share the love of Christ with our tongues. If you look down at verse 1, he, he calls us to be people who bring soft answers when there is anger and wrath. You see, a soft answer goes against everything of the world, doesn't it, when there is anger and strife. It shows the gospel so clearly because the world says, the, if someone hurts you, hurt them. If someone strikes you, strike them back. And a gentle word causes the wrath to dissipate. It, it's linked in with uh, a verse in verse 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger, patient man, quietens, contention. Apparently when lightning comes, uh, there are two electric clouds. I don't know what, what you think I've been reading this week, but the, the lightning comes down and it strikes. And we know the effects of lightning. We know David Jones, don't we? He had to go up uh, 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 to a house the other day as a fireman that had been struck and there was fire and there was devastation. When two come together, lightning always brings devastation. But if there is a conductor, if there is no, no friction, there is no lightning. And this is what this gentle answer is about. It conducts, it takes the pain, it takes the hurt, and it omits the goodness. It, it reflects the gospel, doesn't it? That even though we shout and we blaspheme, uh, the Lord God, with a gentle word, shares Christ, shares life with us. It seems so powerless and spiritless, doesn't it? But I can tell you, it endures forever. Grace goes a long way. A gentle answer goes a long way. The impact shows the love to the person and not ourselves. It's selfless. It hurts. It's costly, but it loves. It's not about winning the argument, but winning the person. There's a story in Judges 8 uh, of Gideon dealing with the Ephraimites, and they're angry that they've been left out of a war. And Gideon speaks to them gently, and persuades them around. But there's a story a few chapters later where the Ephraimites are angry again. They're probably one of those people, aren't they? They're always angry about certain things. And Jephath says a harsh word and it causes devastation. We see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see someone who spoke so patiently with people. You know, we look at the disciples, don't we? And they get it so wrong. And the Lord God just speaks so gently to him. He, he, it is one of the fruits of the Spirit, isn't it? To be gentle. But he loved them and cared for them and was so good to them. With a rich young ruler. Oh, I would be so impatient. A person didn't keep his commandments, but said he did. Who had taken everything of God's and... Ultimately, he made this life about himself and the Lord Jesus Christ was overwhelmed with love, with compassion, and was gentle with them. It's that moment, isn't it? It's just absolutely beautiful, our Saviour. Is that when he, people were spitting at him, ripping out his beard, when he's been struck on the back, when people were angry at him because he'd shown them for who they were. He said these beautiful, gentle words. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. 
Oh, the gentleness, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the heart of someone who is gentle is, has been overwhelmed, doesn't he, by, by love and absorbs the pain because they understand their saviors absorb the pain for them. They would say certain passages and they would think about certain passages and, and they would think like this, why not rather be wronged? They would overlook because Christ overlooked us. They would want to cover the person's sin, not bring it up and destroy the person. They turn the other cheek, they go the extra mile. They do it because the, they love the person because they know the person is just like them and needs to be shown a gentle answer. What a people we would be, wouldn't we, if we were gentle people? Imagine the place Kasalim would be and churches around if we laid down our lives for each other and used our tongue not to cause strife and to cause division, but to build up and encourage, to love the unlovable, to look at ways when people are angry to be gentle. See, naturally it doesn't come our way, does it? Naturally we, we want to fight but grace gives us wisdom at the time to close our mouths to to open our mouths in Ephesians 4 it says don't let any corrupt talk come out of your mouth it says uh, just use your words for building up so that people who listen hear the grace it says please don't grieve the Holy Spirit whom you're sealed by the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor, slander, be put away from along with malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. It's an overflow of the heart, isn't it? And a heart that is harsh and embittered is a heart really that has forgotten grace. Verse 1 of chapter 15. Chapter 15 says, a harsh word stirs up anger. We know it, don't we? We know that there are people who sometimes in a situation can pour petrol on the fire. It is said that a snake just underneath its tongue has its poison canister. I don't think that's the technical word, but it has its poison there. And it, it, as it sinks its uh, uh, teeth, into its prey, the poison seeps in. And just like the forked tongue of someone who, who is angry and harsh, it goes deep down into the victim. You see, the snake wants to paralyze, destroy its prey. It wants the blood of the victim to go poisonous and ultimately wants to kill them. And the effects, we know the effects of a harsh word, don't we? It stirs up anger, it brings division. It breaks down communication, it leads to people hurting each other, discord, more anger and strife. Jesus says, look, don't let that hatred start because it'll lead to murder. Don't ever let the words raka come out from your tongue because it leads to other things. He says, if you're presenting your gift, at the temple, you go, you go and sort it out with your brother quickly. There's that verse 17, better is dinner of herbs where love is than a fat and ox and hatred with it. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? You could just, you know, I've been to dinner parties where you know that the people hate each other. You know, posh, everything. You'd have the, the fat and calf, but there'd be tension. And you'd rather be having some kale. And who likes kale but with someone you love? The question is, why would, why would you be harsh? Harshness is being unpleasantly rough or jarring the senses or being cruel or severe. And you see, so often uh, Christians are, uh, can be the worst in this area. We're no good at confrontation. We, we don't rebuke each other in love. We're very good at rebuking or we're very good at not speaking to each other in a, a loving way. And really we want to exert our authority over the other person or we make excuses because we, we think we need to 
tell the person they need to hear this. So we you speak in a way which shows our self-assertion, but really it's our defensive nature. It's making us number one, not really caring about the person in front of us by the way we speak and the way we act and causes massive, massive devastation. You see, the world uh, want to hurt. The world wants to get back, wants to take back what the other person's said. And you know what? It, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We have a family member uh, at the moment who has taken someone to court over something that they've said, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. The money that's been paid is thousands, nearly hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it's because they're not willing to back down. Their feelings have been hurt and they want to feel protected and they want to put the person in place. And ultimately, they want to assert themselves over that person. They feel powerless, so it just gets worse and worse and worse. And we can understand how wars happen. As Christians, we should be people who are gentle with each other. And not only gentle with each other, gentle with the people outside. We shouldn't be harsh when people are being harsh. You know, there are so many times people are, are harsh on Facebook at the moment and Twitter. And I see Christians writing harsh things to each other. And you think, what are you doing? You're pouring uh, petrol on the flames. And it just gets more and more out of hand as we see people's hearts and their anger overflowing. I used to preach out a lot uh, uh, um, while I was looking to go to a church. And I've been to churches where some people have served me a cup of tea in a way that made me feel pretty scared. They, they served a cup of tea in such a bad way that they wanted to exert their authority over me, even though I'd just come in for the day to preach and share the gospel. You see, they, they wanted power. They wanted people to listen and so often that the harsh word is about power. It's wanting to silence other people so that they can listen to you and make you the, the master of the area. You may want people to know that your way is the right way, but the, that way is not the way of the Lord's. See, when we live like this, we, we find out what's really within our hearts. Matthew 15 says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. What comes from our hearts are murder, adultery, sexual immor immorality, theft, false witness, slander. It goes on and goes on and on. I think so often Christians live like uh, uh, their tongue is... Uh, not under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we will have to answer for every careless word. In that moment, don't we? If we are uh, wanting to destroy the person, we just care about our feelings being sorted. You know, our feelings are so unhelpful. Our feelings, majority of the time, lead us to sin. There are times where they lead us to worship, but majority of the time, if you're anything like me, lead us to not think right and feel the wrong way. When people come before the, the living God, the Bible says that every mouth will be shut. There'll be no harsh person uh, trying to exert the authority of the Lord because they'll know who's in charge. And so often people live this world like they're in charge. I love Jonathan Edwards' resolutions. They're full of grace and they're full of gentleness. It says this, I resolve never to speak evil of anyone so they shall tend to his dishonor more or less upon no account except for some real good. Number 36 says this, I resolve never to speak evil of any except I have some particular good call for it. Number 70, let there be something of benevolence in all that I speak. May it be kind to all. I think Jonathan Edwards knew what was in his heart. I think Jonathan Edwards knew what he was capable of and the tongue and the effect of it. And so he wanted to use it for good. You see, it does matter what we talk about. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge. 
but the mouths of the fool pour out folly. It matters about the attitude of the heart, but also it matters what we say as well. Do we have a heart that uh, cares uh, for the things of God or the matters of this world? Will we have a church that build up each other and use our tongues uh, to commend the knowledge of the Lord, or will we use it just to talk about our latest golf round? You think, I think we, we spend hours dwelling upon things which are pure folly. We know people who walk into this church who need to be encouraged. As we prayed on Tuesday, uh, there, there were people, people were saying there are so many people who are in need. And as we come uh, in the, on a Sunday and during the week, we can phone each other up and encourage each other, spend time with each other in this weird lockdown, but time together that we can encourage. There are ways in which we can do that as well. Ways we can speak to each other about the sermon. Things that we found helpful that convicted us, that made us love the Lord Jesus Christ. If we love each other, we'll talk to each other about it. Not in a weird, superficial way, but a way that will help the person and encourage it. And that will only come from spending time with each other. This proverb is telling us that the tongue of the wise will want people to grow. It's a tongue that is selfless, saying that they want a person to love the Lord God more and more, to lift up the Lord Jesus to Christ, to grow in him. You see, the Lord is interested in the way we speak and what we speak about. It's interesting, isn't it, that that, that line in James and in other passages as well in, in Romans, it says that we boast so much about ourselves. It shows what we really care about when we speak. And there are certain people I chat about that always talk about their family, their friends, their daily routines, their, their certain uh, exercise programs. And you think, that's great, but we never talk about the Lord. We're so quick to talk about ourselves, lift ourselves up and not lift the Lord Jesus Christ up. And our tongues give us away we so often pour out folly things which are worthless in many regards but it, it is interesting isn't it that when people come before the living God like Isaiah he says phrases like I have uh, lips which are unclean I stand within a people who have unclean lips if we know anything about the people of Isaiah's time they were religious hypocrites gossips fault finders, they were people who uh, were blasphemers. And Isaiah comes and when he comes before the living God, he realises the folly that he has dwelt upon and he has to have a bigger view of God. And from that moment on, when he uh, meets the living God, he, he wants to build up and encourage. He wants Jesus to be lifted up. He just wants the seed to be shown for who he is. But the mouths of fools pour out folly. I wonder if you, if you go to the local pub and see what they talk about. It's very interesting. Uh, what they do talk about is usually about the Welsh rugby team, family, work, play. They talk about politics. And I think so often I've been to many churches where pretty much it's like the local pub or the, the, the local uh, the local place where people catch up on the village gossip. You see, so often the, the people of God can spend hours on subjects that they really want to talk about, and it's not the living God. It comes from a heart of wanting to look God. It comes from a heart of wanting people to respect and revere them. And the Lord says that's just all foolishness and folly. We can make this world all about ourselves. We can make this world about building a kingdom for a day, but it will waste our life, this proverb says. It is folly. We pick up a magazine, don't we, and read the headlines, and it really is folly. Someone's got a new lipstick or a new haircut. You see, God wants us to be people who encourage each other. My friend Glenn Shrivner uh, used to say that we're so poor at sharing the gospel 
um, with non-Christians because we can't share it with each other. And we don't want to dwell upon the things of the Lord. Billy Bray, uh, as he used his tongue for the glory of God, he would go into the pubs and go into all of these gin houses and he would speak to the people and he would say, I I was just like you. And they hated it because he knew, everyone knew that he was a fighter and a blasphemer and a person who who lived for the, the follies of this world. And now he had a new song in his mouth that he wanted to declare a God that he knew and that they could know. And people hated him for it, but in the end they loved him for it because in his words, he turned people to worship the living God. And, and that's the final thing from today. Proverbs 15 verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it will break the spirit. Our lips are so powerful. And our reactions are so powerful. They can lead people to life or death, the Bible says. And with our lips, we can either worship God or we can worship ourselves and condemn other people. There's uh, beautiful feet in the Bible, people who bring good news, but also that we, the Bible calls us to have beautiful tongues. <laughs> tongues that declare God's glory. Words that share about this tree of life. The tree of life is an interesting thing. We haven't got time to do this today, but the tree of life in the Bible is all about knowing the presence of God, knowing the life of God flowing through us, and we're separate from it. But he's saying those people who are gentle, who are loving, who are caring, will give people the chance to know this tree of life. Words that will heal because they come to the God's. The other turn on it is that perverseness will break the spirit. If we have tongues that are perverse, that aren't doing what it's supposed to be doing, if our tongues are just using it to boast or smutty jokes or angry words or gossip and fault finding uh, that go down to the deepest, darkest remnants of our hearts, if we use our words to flatter and be two-faced, then... They won't lead people to the tree of life. They'll lead people away. It's interesting in, in the cowboys and Indian films. I've watched a few of them. Members got me into them. But uh, it was always interesting what the Indians used to say. Uh, they said, white man has forked tongue. The people who they fought, fought against were always renowned for having two faces, having perverseness, perverseness in their tongue how different it is to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who brings the words of eternal life. His yes is yes. He's not two-faced. He doesn't boast. He doesn't flatter. He doesn't say smutty jokes. No, he's holy and good and loves us and speaks the word of life to us. He has the words of eternal life. And he calls us to follow in his footsteps. When Jesus speaks, life comes to dead bones. Life comes to people who are actually dead in their sins. And he uses his tongue to build up and encourage. Will we, as a people, do that? Will we be gentle? Will we love knowledge and build each other up? And will we be people who use our tongues to lead people to the tree of life? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, giving us your word, showing us our hearts, but also blessing us by showing us the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. Help us with all these things, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Let's sing to close. Yeah.